Welcome to Accordion Life Academy. I'm Patricia Bartel, and today, as we dive into the history of Honor and the role it plays, not only in the accordion world, but also the music industry as a whole, the best one I know to bring in to share with you Honor's journey as a company is my friend, Gilbert Reyes. Gilbert, welcome to Accordion Life. So great to have you with us today. Hi, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's, a, it's an honor to be here with you today. Yeah. Yeah, it's been so it's been quite a while since we've seen each other and obviously with COVID travel restrictions and everything, but even at this way, we at least get to see each other. Yeah, it's been an interesting couple of years, uh, to say the least. And this one has been interesting as well, but uh we've managed to survive. So, you know, thank yes. God we're 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 doing well, right? <laughs> yes. So tell me, you know, speaking of surviving, so you know, Honor has been around for a really, really long time. Uh, over a century, how has a company like this been able to survive for so long? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, uh, Honer started back in 1857. Um, uh, Matthias Honer was the founder of the company. And this gentleman was uh, a clock uh, maker back then, you know, and he was also into agriculture because in those days in Trossingen, Germany, it was about either you're a, uh, either you're a farmer, you know, were more into the agriculture or you did something else and he decided to do clockwork, right? So he was repairing and selling clocks. And then one day he got into this whole thing about harmonicas, right? Apparently the story goes that he saw somebody else doing it. He got intrigued and then he uh, eventually started getting into it. What he didn't realize that he was going to kind of change the, the music industry forever because it started with harmonicas, right? So what started happening is he started building them, or I'm sorry, making them. And, uh, and then he started producing them. And, and it wasn't a lot in the beginning, you know, there was a, a lot of trial and error in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But then as, as uh, he started uh, selling it to, uh, to a lot of immigrants who were coming into the U.S. at that time, you know, so it was more the distribution channel, if you will, was families. Families would come to, to Germany, they would take harmonicas with them, they would sell them. So that's how the whole distribution channel started. Uh, so it, it, it wasn't planned. Uh, and before you know it, and I'm, I'm going to kind of skip some of these things because there's, it's, it's a long history. Yeah. But before you know it, they started growing little by little. Uh, uh, all of a sudden, in 1901, uh, they opened their first office in New York. Uh, and, and, and then United States became their number one distributor in harmonica. So what turned into, you know, family business, all of a sudden it started uh, changing because now they started working with uh, distribution companies or agents. They were called agents at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it went from minimal uh, accordion, I mean, I'm sorry, harmonica sales to uh, millions of them, you know, I think by 1907, they already had sold like, I don't know, maybe like 2 million harmonicas. Are you serious? But, That's yeah, easy. absolutely. Wow. So, so uh, what was happening too, it, was, it wasn't just selling, it was also innovation. For example, they were coming up with, uh, it was during the industrial revolution when they started getting new ideas on how to manufacture, for example, how to mass produce, how to come out with reeds. Um, so they started innovating, similar to what, you know, Henry Ford did, right, with the cars. Yeah. So they were doing with harmonicas. But what's really interesting is, you know, you asked the question, well, how, how did they manage to grow? And I think, uh, you know, part of it, obviously, we're going to talk about the accordions. But, but I think what they did is, is, uh, is establishing distribution routes or channels worldwide. And they did this with harmonica. Mm -hmm. So they started sending representatives to the U.S., to Argentina, to Brazil, to all places all over the world. So these representatives would learn about the music, the culture, and they started selling some. I'll give you a good example, for example. Uh, there's a gentleman who, who opened up a distribution channel in 1908 in Mexico. Uh, his name is uh, uh, Frederick. So what he did is he, he was sent to Mexico and he was selling to the indigenous people harmonicas and and then they decided to open a, a store or a, a distribution center if you will so then little by little they started growing the business and then they started distributing instead of coming through the new york ports 
they were coming through Mexican ports, no. bringing in the harmonicas. So, which laid the foundation for eventually accordions to come into the country. So you have to understand that it was a distribution channel that they created that was going to be the success for Honer in the future. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's interesting because um, so many people that even I've talked to when they think of Honer, you know, they think it's the harmonicas, you know, because there's so many of that. It's like, oh, the harmonicas, you know, in my world, it's like, oh, it's an accordion. But in that time to understand how he started from there. And you mentioned a lot about, you know, the family part of it. Do you think that's one of the contributions to them surviving for so long? It's just a different focus. No, I think that has a lot to do with it because uh, you have to understand that the Honer family was very conservative. You know, they, uh, Matthias Honer had five sons. So when he passed away uh, in, in 19, oh, it was 1900, the, the five sons took over the business. Okay. So then as, 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 as much as Matthias didn't want to get into the accordion business, the sons did. So once he passed away, then the next generation took it on and they said, well, we need to figure out how we're going to get into accordion making. So by 1903, they started their first factories on uh, accordions. Well, the idea was, uh, as far as their sons, uh, is that, well, look, we have all this manufacturing capability. We have the distribution channels. Um, plus, and you have to understand that in the beginning, there were diatonic accordions. There weren't piano accordions. So if you look at all the catalogs and of the, the era or that time period, you don't see piano accordions. Why? So, so the diatonic was first? It was first, absolutely. Wow. And I'll tell you why. It was first because if you look at the, the, the instrument of the harmonica, right? It's, okay. let's say, a 10-row, ten 10-hole, ten right? Mm -hmm. It's diatonic. What does that mean? That when you blow on the, on the harmonica one note and you, and, and you inhale, that's another note. Well, the diatonic accordion is the same concept. So if you look at the one-row right. accordion, it's basically a harmonica, but you don't use your mouth. You use your hands with the bellows, right? Right. So then they started developing the two row and then the three row. So they had the same concept of the harmonica. So therefore, they started manufacturing diatonic accordions first. Right. So that's interesting because I, I didn't know that, you know, with the diatonic. So when they did the distribution channel in, in uh, Mexico. So is that why, you know, we see now the diatonic is so strong? Well, th this is interesting because it's more complex than that. You know, because there's this huge debate right now between the musicians from Mexico and the musicians from the U.S. You know, so the, the, the musicians from the U.S. as well, the diatonic accordion in the regional Mexican or whatever originated out of uh, or Tex-Mex out of the Americas. Right. Or the United States. I'm sorry. The our friends from the other side of the border. No, it originated out of Mexico. Uh, there's no history as to where it, 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 it the starting point was what we do know is that um accordions started coming in into the americas way before honer you know because there was independent uh mom and pop factories that italians were coming in the french were coming in they would bring their own instruments they didn't have huge distribution channels like honer did but they would sell some of these accordions Mm -hmm. with different brands because honer wasn't the first one people say was honer the first one no not really okay. already in the late 1800s accordions were being manufactured and and were being sold all over the world again it wasn't mass production it was you know a few at a time or whatever so right. um, but but what's interesting is that uh the it it became part of the part of the culture of the mexican music to a certain degree Mm -hmm. But it was more of uh, more for the, the, the working class, the, the poor working class who basically embraced this, this instrument. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's why you didn't really see much of it later. I mean, when I was growing up in South Texas, even then, you know, the diatonic accordion was, well, it was a part of my family because I'm third generation diatonic accordion player. But it was always seen as, well, you guys are, you know, you guys, your parents are, you know, work in, in agriculture, you're cotton pickers or whatever. Right. So you guys play this poor man's music. So really? it wasn't really that 
it wasn't that popular. It was it was seen more as like, uh, you know, it's for the uneducated, for the poor, for those who don't have very much resources, if you will. Mm -hmm. So it's been in our community. Uh, but I think the progress of the Latino community has been more recent because of demographics and, 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 and the growing number of our population. I mean, there's mm -hmm. 54 million Latinos in the U.S. right now, right? Yeah. But you have to also consider that there's no border between the U.S. and Mexico because the music flows freely back and forth. You can't put walls or borders between the music and the culture. It mm -hmm. just flows back and yeah. forth. So. Exactly. And I think that's one thing I love about music is in general. It's, it's an international language, you yes. know, regardless of what, you know, country we go to. And every country has their flavor of music, you know. And I've loved, like, you know, from Mexico, even when uh, in Europe, just the, the way the people are with their instrument. So tell me now, uh, with Honor, because one of the things that I'm in the music education field and I think I've seen a lot of their instruments in, like, say, the orp instruments, the children. How is, what does that part look like in, with Honor in the music education field? Well, it's interesting because, uh, you know, by the 1920s, the piano accordion started coming into the picture. Uh, and then it accelerated the 30s, the 1940s, 1950s. I mean, piano accordions became uh, second to harmonica sales worldwide. And what was happening at the time is that um, schools, I mean, all over the world, not this, just the US, but what was happening is that they were starting to develop uh, literature, for example, music uh, for how to play the accordion. And I think that the idea was that, well, if you play the piano, you could probably get you know, the piano accordion and kind of learn easily. Then it started becoming part of the school system. If you look at the, in the U.S., for example, um, by the 1950s, piano accordions were all over the place. I mean, high schools had mm -hmm. programs. There was independent programs. Right. Major stores all over the country, or even mom and pop shops were selling accordions or giving lessons, yeah. you know? Yeah. So Just even became, here in Spokane, there was like 20 competing accordion studios, you know? Yes. And now... There's just ours, just one. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing. So, so it became a uh, uh, it became um, um, a part of the the main mainstream music uh, scene, if you will. Uh, and 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 the reason is because I mean, you, if you look at the history of all the immigrants that came into the U.S., you know, you're talking about you know, Italian Americans, uh, you know, uh, Irish. Uh, Polish, you name it, you know, they all had similarities as far as when it came to the piano recording experiences, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so it started becoming part of the school system as well. I mean, um, and I think important, the important part of this was that there was uh, uh, literature. Mm -hmm. People could actually learn music notation, actually learn how to play certain songs. And that's why it became popular with, with the school system, right? Right, yeah. Um, fast forward now, uh, it's a different animal. It's not like that anymore. Uh, I think that, you know, yeah, we, we try uh, to, and, we, and we, we are successful with the music, uh, um, uh, the, the music curriculums and stuff like that across the U.S., but really it's more about other instruments, not the piano accordion. Mm -hmm. What's taken over really? It's brass instruments, it's uh, other instruments, guitars, ukuleles, uh, accordions. Now has is just sort of like a, a small portion of of you know the, the what's being uh, um, offered in, in most school systems. I, and I I believe that most and you probably know this, most schools don't even or communities have no idea about accordions. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, because I and when we look at the demographics here in the United States, it's you know, uh, it's a predominant older generation that you know still plays accordion, loves accordion, and the younger generation has been very minimal. You know, uh, I know different rock bands, pop culture, they're bringing in the accordion, but to really have it like thriving amongst the young people, like say Europe and also Mexico. It's there. It's non-existent right now. 
Well, I wouldn't say not. And I think it's. But. I think what what we're seeing though is worldwide. You know, the decline that happened here in the U.S. is not only happening here, but it's happening in Europe. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, in Germany, I, I remember uh, visiting the factory one year, and a, a young man they hired to pick us up from the airport. It's an hour drive from Stuttgart to Trossingen. So the the young man is asking us, well, what are you guys doing here? And we're, we're, we work for Honer. And go, oh, Honer, um, what do they do? And I said, well, harmonicas and accordions. Then, and he goes, wow, really? People still play accordions? That's what he told me. <laughs> yeah. You know. And I'm talking about a kid that lives in that area. Wow. So that tells you a lot. I mean, I know it's just one person. Yeah. But it tells you a lot because I mean, we're talking about a, a young kid who must have been like 18 or 19. Mm-hmm. And so you have a, a huge generation, a, a young generation that's not in tune with it or doesn't really look at it or care about it. Right. You know? And it seems so like, it, it, yeah, since uh, Hono expanded into the instruments, I mean, we did that in my academy. It's like, uh, you know, it's founded with accordion and piano, but to survive, and build a company, we had to go into other instruments, and so did Honer, you know, yes. with, from the ORF instruments, which are used for the toddlers, all the way up to, I mean, they've got some pretty high class, you know, like in the percussion, um, you know, sections and all that. Yeah, and, and I think, though, what, what we're seeing, though, is there's starting to be a shift in it, though. I mean, I'm not saying that it's all doom and gloom. I think that all of a sudden we see a, a spike, you know, as far as piano accordions are concerned. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're starting to see a little bit more um, uh, young people interested in it. I mean, I'm seeing it here in Nashville, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, some young artists that are playing with really famous country and Americana bands. So it's exciting because I'm yeah. thinking, okay, we see something that's happening. And and then when I get, you know, we get messages from people from, or, you know, musicians from all over the country. And it's like, there's a trend happening. Uh, we don't know what it's going to look like, but uh, it's going to be exciting within the next five to 10 years mm-hmm. to see what, what's going to happen. And I think what's going to happen is really uh, <laughs> that old generation that kind of made it uncool is leading and... <laughs> And the new generation's coming up and picking it up and saying, wow, this is a cool instrument. I think mm-hmm. that's what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. I think so, too, because there's got to be a, a new generation that sees that and takes it on. You know, I mean, I'm going to do my part. So, you know, as we go. Well, on. And, and I think that's what's happening, because if you talk, if I t- I've talked to some young young musicians here in Nashville and they think it's such a cool, I you know, cool instrument. And then. Uh, I bring, uh, you know, I, I start talking about the history a little bit about, you know, when, you know, a butt of jo- there were a butt of jokes and, you know, they, uh, uh, a lot of stigma about the piano accordion and they've never really heard of, it. you know, it's like, oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. And we you know what? It's cool. Yeah, exactly. And you know, when I got it, even in college for me, which was only just a couple of years ago. Right. And it's like, people are like, you, that's a grandpa's box, you know? But then once, you know, I played, it's like I felt like I was a rock star. I mean, they're out, you know, standing and yelling and shouting. Um, Even recently, I was playing with uh, another um, well-known musician on the cello. And somebody in the audience didn't know I was the accordionist. I was just coming through sitting there. And they walked in and they saw the accordion by the chair. And they're like, oh, my goodness, not an accordion. I don't know if I I can do this. But she came up to me afterwards and said, and told me her comment. And I heard her, you know, thinking, okay. And I love that because it gives me an opportunity to give them an experience with the accordion in a way that they could love it, you know, at least they have the opportunity. And she did. She came up and she said, I had no idea that it could sound like that. Because I think in the U.S., and let me know too, it's like predominantly it's been in the folk music, folk culture. And so, you know, back in when it was, there's so many accordions. I mean, it's like, I, it didn't evolve as quickly into other sectors of music, like say in the Eastern European countries where they take the accordion as a very classical instrument, you know, versus in the accordion. I mean, that was the number one response as well as it being a grandpa's box is like, you play polkas, it's a polka box, a squeeze box, right? So... I think it's part of it's just education and getting more people aware. I agree. 
I agree. And I think in the US, what you started seeing, like when I when at the height of the piano accordion movement, I mean, like you talked about, there was um, classical music, you know, uh, mm -hmm. was being taught. There was a lot of orchestras too. So yeah. it was different. And of course, you had your polka bands. And I think that's what people think of, you know, because yeah. your grandpa played a polka in a polka band. It's right. like, oh, here we go. Yeah. Oompa, oompa, right? Here, and, here's uh, the thing, yeah, here's the thing, though, about that. Just just like confession. So I hope my students don't cringe at this. But <laughs> I actually I actually love polkas. It's happy music. But I also love a whole genre, different types of music from the classical, from the French, from the Nuevo Tangos, which is one of my faves. But I think they all have their place. I think we just needed kind of a balance to bring into it. What do you what do you think? I, I totally agree. I think I think mainstream America kind of um, turned their backs on this folk music that you talk about. You know, uh, the 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 polka, for example, it's it's corny and whatever. But it's really interesting though because um, if you look at the Mexicans or, or not Mexicans, the Latinos, right? Latinos, because, yeah. Uh, they play polkas, mm -hmm. and the young generation love it. You know, and they it's do. thriving, and. Uh, but it's different because what they did is they took the music and did their own spin with a button accordion, not a piano accordion. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what's interesting though is that, um, so you have that right, and then, and then I, I've I've read some uh, books where you know some people say, well, I I forgot her name, but anyway, she was talking about how she rejected her parents' music because it was corny, you know. Mm -hmm. And but then when she started listening to guys like Flaco Jimenez, she goes, "Wow, I found a new found interest in the in the accordion music because of what the Latinos were doing with it." You know, yeah, so it's kind of interesting to to, yeah. to see that. Uh huh. And just to kind of segue a little bit into because I find this so so um, interesting that like you talk about Flaco Jimenez, so in the Latino community, they really look up to their heroes that are playing the accordion. Um, more different, much different than I think some of the young, you know, our generation in the pop music or even in the piano world, it's like they just go to whoever's popular. But it's different in the Latino, yes? It is. Uh, it's it's an interesting phenomenon because if you look at, for example, there's a famous group called Los Tigres del Norte. They've been around since the 70s. Mm -hmm. But they're like uh, major in the in the Mexican or the Latino community, and um, you go to the concerts; they're packed. But if you look at the audience, the age group is from 17 to 32. That's the age group. Mm -hmm. So it's a young population that's listening to the music. Uh, the kids that are learning how to play accordion, the young ones as well as the you know the uh, the adults, are learning uh, old music that was being made in the 50s and 60s so it they sort of like they, they embrace the the traditional music they embrace their parents music they embrace their grandparents music mm -hmm. and that's kind of an interesting phenomenon because mainstream america you said it you know if you go to let's say the rolling stones concert if you look at the audience what are you going to see you're not going to see young people you're going to see typically my age or older, <laughs> you know, although they, they're, they're, I mean, you can't compare it. I mean, obviously they're, they're famous, but, but the demographics, you can see it right away, you know, right. and, uh, yeah. and, and, but the embrace of the, the, the music and the culture, I think it's what's big with this community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So was there ever a time in with Connor as a company that they ever doubted whether, you know, any hard times where they, could have closed the doors and stopped or did they always just have this progressive you know just growth you know naturally growing all the way through because you know some companies they get to those points like it's a make it or break it deal so it's like can we keep going can we not what did they do because since they've been around well, for so long there's some hard times even in the just yes well economy. i mean they they Honor has survived you know recessions wars depressions pandemics <laughs> They survived. Now, I think uh, the uh, what's kept us afloat really is the harmonicas. I mean, harmonicas have always done well. P uh, accordions was a different story. When I came on board, you know, in 2008, uh, accordions were on life support. 
You know, I mean, it, I, I thought that, okay, in a few years, you know, Honer is not going to be relevant in the accordion world at all, period, because we didn't have new products. We didn't have, uh, we weren't reaching out to the communities and we weren't doing anything innovative. And uh, all the knowledge that was here many years ago was gone. You know, I came in and nobody knew anything about accordions. Even Germany didn't know much about accordions, you know, I mean, I mean, I was lucky to have worked with some people in, in Germany that were good and but they left eventually and it was like okay nobody else knows am i the only one who knows about accordions so i kind of took it upon myself to try to revive the accordion market in the u.s and i think we've been successful you know uh Absolutely. but there's still much more to do because we've found a formula but now we want to expand it even more towards the piano accordion world uh, mm -hmm which uh, I'm doing, you know, these next few years because we've been very successful with the diatonic accordion, but uh, there's more to do. Yeah. And so that leads me to uh, one of our, my final questions is what is uh, Honer doing now to innovate? What's, what's coming? You know, where is it going right now? Well, you know, the last 10 years, we've done a lot as far as accordions. I mean, um, one of the things, I mean, if, if you look at the history of Honer, if you look at catalogs from 1907, you know, way in the beginning, you know, we, we were offering, we have some old catalogs where we were offering Italian accordions, Italian mm. made button accordions. Right. Yeah. And so there's always just been this notion that, well, you know, it's all made in Germany. No. So what we did is we eventually went back to that, you know, with the new Anacleto line, for example, mm -hmm. uh, we decided to find a factory in Italy to make our, our premium product, if you will, our premium accordion. Uh, with new designs, with uh, with uh, 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 new new colors, new everything, you know, uh, something different for the market, that became very successful. Uh, we started exploring. Okay, well, maybe we should make a high end piano accordion in Italy as well, which then the Mattia was born, you know. And I think has it really hasn't been rolled out as yet, but that's going to be coming up here in the next few years. Um, so this, this collaboration between Italy and Germany is, I think, uh, uh, it's kind of emerged again as a, a new, a new force for us. I mean, because when we came out with the Marino, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Marino Italian, you know, he started, yeah. he moved to Trossingen and, and started working for Honer from 1928 to about 1956. Well, he was producing these high-end piano accordion and that was innovative at that time you know right, it was like yeah. wow and everybody wanted these very expensive made by mr marino you know and mm -hmm. so uh i think we're kind of well like they say history kind of repeats itself right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so now we have anacato gabanelli doing accordions for us and doing high-end accordions and and it's changing it's changed the market i think because what's happened uh with with the new line of uh Italian made accordions, it created a halo effect for us. So all of a sudden now we were cool again because they have, we have a premium product. Plus we also have all the other levels. We have the entry, the mid range, the high end. Mm -hmm. So customers uh, automatically say, wow, man, these guys, you guys know what they're doing, you know? So it gave us some credibility in the market. So Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing I've appreciated about Honor is that, you know, they don't just, um, they haven't just stuck to these certain instruments, but they've really listened to the people. And it's like, okay, well, how can we meet more needs? And I think hence why we have so many, why Honor has so many varieties of like even the Anacletos or some of the other mid-range uh, and beginning ones, you know, for like say uh, families that come through our academy, you know, they can't afford the 10,000 Twenty thousand dollar instruments, like say, in the piano accordion world, because they just need to know: is their child actually going to play the accordion? Yeah, you know? so. yeah. And we have some entry, good entry level piano accordions. We have the Bravo, for example, which has mm -hmm. been successful for us. Uh, it comes in 48, 72, 96, 120 bass. Yeah. So we have everything. Uh, yeah. I think uh, a pretty good selection in our uh, accordion portfolio. If you yeah, will. absolutely. And I would love the Bravos. Number one is because it's so lightweight. 
And I know, uh, you know, it's a popular one accordion for you too, because the bands, you know, they need to stand up, you know, and I had some of the kids using uh, the fun flashes and man, they're like, okay, buff up and we can do this because they did a lot of stage work. So, but you know, when it comes to uh, even people that want to do the bands or whatever, and they need to do strolling, you know, the Bravo's accordion has been really great for that. So, so, well, Gilbert, thank you so much for coming on with me today and just because it's been interesting to know and learn of this company, especially for me as in business, to see how do companies like this survive? You know, what has been the kind of under, underlying mission that's kept them moving forward, their, uh, their vision, and how they're continuing to supply all of us with uh, our favorite instruments. So any last words you want to give us about Honer and... Well, I no, I just want to say, uh, you know, thank you. Uh, and I really appreciate that the work you're doing. I mean, I think uh, it's because of you that you're bringing in a new generation to appreciate this instrument, which is important. And I wish we could just replicate you a thousand times, you know, to to in every state, you know, but yeah, uh, and hopefully someday that'll happen. But, but you're planting the seeds, though, you're planting the seeds little by little. And yeah. that's what's going to what that's what's going to take to 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 get everybody starting to play the piano accordion again yes you know and we appreciate you know honor um coming alongside us and supporting yeah. and you know from our this according life today magazine to the academy uh just the students so it's i can see even from the business perspective because i love that i love the business side of how they have survived, you know, it's not just like, they're not in it just like, okay, we just want to make money and let's go for it because this, this industry is, a um, it takes a lot of passion, you know, and want to. Well, you're, you're right. You know, you, you hit something really interesting because for me, it's always been about the community, right? So how do we give back to the community? I mean, it's not just, you're right. It's not just here, buy our products. Right. You got to give back. And so that's why we try to help different schools we we try to donate certain products to children who don't have money to to buy these accordions so that's very important to me you know and i think um i think that i think that's one of the reasons we're also successful because it's not just about the money it's about how do we help our people our community the children (laughs) that is is key yes absolutely so all right thank you so much again for let me ask you questions and just to understand the honor as a whole. So, all right. Until next time, this is accordionlifeacademy.com.